I'm Regina, and um, we're here today with my fifth grade arch nemesis and winemaker at Deloach Vineyards, Brian Maloney. Hi, Regina. Hi, Brian. To um, so current arch nemesis, too. Okay. Okay, if there you we say go. So. There we go. Um, to discuss French wines. At Ileone, we, um, we, you know, we sell a lot of products that are, we sell beautiful French products and we adore the French culinary tradition, but French wines are something that I don't know very much about. Um, my experience with wine for most of my life stemmed from my grandfather's home winemaking efforts, and as such, that kind of, for a long time, those efforts kind of stymied my desire to explore other winemaking traditions. So we're here with my friend me, Brian, and we, he's a winemaker, and we're going to talk about French wines in honor of Bastille Day. Well, thank you, Regina, Hi. and uh, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, it's French <laughs> wine and California wine are all, um, you know, kind of can be uh, hard subjects to get into, kind of like getting to be a friend of yours, you know? It doesn't, it doesn't start easy, but after many, many years of study and work, you know, eventually you start to see there's a lot there. Really? Well, with French wine, at least, yes. Okay, with me, no? <laughs> We're still learning. We're still learning. It's right. only been 30 plus years or so. I'm um, so. about as deep as a teaspoon. Yeah. So. Um, but with French wine in particular, it can get very confusing and there's no area that gets more confusing than Burgundy. And that's because Burgundy has a very, very long history of winemaking going back at, that we know to Roman times, possibly oh. older than that. Okay. And it, it really, um, it's funny, it's so confusing because at the end of the day, it's really about two varieties, um, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Okay. And, uh, you know, at the Loche Vineyards here in the Russian River Valley in the center of Sonoma County, uh, we've been pioneers working with those two varieties going back to the mid-1970s. Uh, I joined the team here in uh, 2003 okay. and uh, really uh, got to appreciate the, the influence of French wines uh, shortly after I started mm -hmm. um, because the Boisset family from Burgundy, France actually came over and they purchased uh, this estate in 2003. Okay. And uh, the, the family there has been making wine for many, many years and uh, this was a, a big move for them. This was their first winery that they owned in California. And also it's the first time a Burgundian family had come to California to purchase property and to make the traditional Burgundian varieties, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. So we um, are uh, very much pioneers in many ways, but uh, that celebration is something that's really important to us here at Deloche and something I'm happy to, to share what, what I know about it. Yes. So question, what is the difference between the Burgundian wines I was growing in Burgundy and their counterparts in California because you grow Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Yes. They're Burgundian, is that the correct? Yes. Okay, correct term. They're uh, French varietal, varietals? Yes. Yeah. Varieties, yes. Right, whatever, I don't care. Um, <laughs> what, what's the difference between what's grown in California and what's grown in France? Well, the, the they are the same exact grape. In okay. fact, we have the same rootstocks. So the bottom of the vine that grows in the ground are the mm -hmm. same, and the top of the vine, the clonal material, um, that's the same as well. The big difference uh, is kind of everything else. It's what we call terroir. Okay. Um, and so terroir, it's a French word. It means essentially a place. Uh, and that's why we have these maps behind us because they, they show the places that these grapes are from. Mm -hmm. But terroir is much- I love maps. Yeah, I, I've always loved Fifth maps. Fifth grade geography be champion. Uh, but, but uh, terroir goes much beyond just the, the physical place. Uh, part of it is the soil itself. What is the soil made up? And when we talk about the soils of Burgundy, those are very, very old soils. In fact, this first wine, okay. this is a, a Chablis from the Chablis region in Burgundy, and this is a Chardonnay. So anytime you see Chablis, you're having a Chardonnay, um, unless it's a pink Chablis, which doesn't really exist. Question. Yes. Why don't we just call it a Chardonnay then? Well, that's because historically, um, variety was not an important thing to winemakers. In oh. fact, it's only in the last 50, 60 years or so that variety has become this way of marketing wine and selling wines. Previously, wine was sold from the place it was from. And yeah. so you would talk about a Sonoma wine, or you would talk about a wine from Chablis or a wine from Burgundy. And everyone knew that the wines from Burgundy were going to be made from, if they're a white grape, it was gonna be made from Chardonnay. And if it was a red grape, it was gonna be Pinot Noir. In mm -hmm. fact, there were laws passed uh, by the king um, to outlaw any which other king? variety. Uh, I believe it was one of the Louis, I don't know exactly which one. Um, and they literally outlawed certain red grapes from being grown in Burgundy. Okay. So uh, they took it seriously. That's quite. Yes. Um, so this Chablis, uh, Chablis is a, a sub-region of Burgundy, so this is one of the reasons why it gets so confusing, um, because you have to just know that Chablis is part of Burgundy 
you don't know that Chablis is its own little subregion. Okay. Um, and the soils in Chablis are very, very old. In fact, they are the Timurigian soils. They come from ancient oyster beds. And wow. so these are when this part of Western Europe was actually under a shallow sea mm -hmm. and there was years and years, millions of years of oysters growing and growing and growing until you have deposits that are tens of meters deep. And then literally 200 million years later, we are now growing grapevines on top of it. Yes. Question, how, many, how much is that in feet? We're in America. So uh, let's, let's say that the soils are, you know, about 30 to 50 feet deep in terms of the, the, the Kimmeridgean soil. Okay, cool. So, can I pour a little bit in your glass? Why not? So yes, so we have very old soils. Okay. Now the other major difference that we have here is that the, the climate and the location, we're in a much further northerly position mm -hmm. on the earth. And so you have much longer days during the summertime, okay. but you have a much narrower, much shorter growing wind, uh, season because it's a much colder winter and okay. you have longer nights during that winter to the spring. Do they have snow in the winter? They do. Very, very and, here. In fact, uh, Chablis often has to deal with uh, uh, frost, late season frost. It can be very, very uh, dangerous and damaging to the vines. In fact, 2017, which we're enjoying right now, this Oceana 2017 Chablis, uh -huh. uh, was one of those vintages where they, they struggled with late season frost. Yikes. So here we have, okay. first we're gonna smell. It's gonna smell, okay. And Chablis always brings a smile on my face. Um, okay. I, I get lots of, uh, you know, kind of citrus fruit elements, especially lime, um, to me, really comes out of this wine. Okay. And then there's a, a this kind of uh, ephemeral, mineral quality to it as well. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a very common flavor profile you see with Chablis. Okay. Good. Very light, very mm -hmm. fresh. Um, this is a wine because we're working with these kind of uh, more smaller flavors, more petite, mm -hmm. um, we tend to match them, or the winemakers tend to match them with less oak. And so this is a wine that sees almost all just stainless steel fermentation mm -hmm. um, and uh, none of the oak barrel influence that you would see in other parts of, of uh, Burgundy for that matter, mm -hmm. as well as in California. All right. So. Yeah, California Chardonnays, which are also would be Chablis. Uh, well, no, they wouldn't be Chablis because they're not from Chablis. Okay, I'm sorry. Be I'm already confused. Russian okay. rivers. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. so we call this a Chablis, yep. it's named after its place, and it is a Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to California, to our, our Delos Chardonnay, and this is coming from the Russian River Valley. Okay. And so the Russian River is roughly a, a square um, centered just to the west of Santa Rosa. In fact, where Delos Vineyards is located mm -hmm. is almost dead center within the Russian River Valley. And it's about 10 miles by 10 miles. Okay, good. Numbers you can understand. Good, um, you should understand. We won both the World Wars. And uh, the, uh, the, the growing good. season is, uh, is very different. Um, it's a longer growing season on the whole. We are much lower in terms of our latitude. Okay. So that we don't see quite the same extremes in terms of day length. Uh, but also, also weather-wise, we tend to uh, have warmer earlier spring mm -hmm. and warmer later fall right. compared to what they see in Chablis. Now, it, one of the kind of interesting concepts when we talk about you know the warmth of the region um, is Chablis uh, what we call a continental climate. And so it actually can get quite hot during the summer mm -hmm. um, where the Russian River, because we're located so close to the Pacific, never quite gets to those same extremes. Okay. And so it's a more moderate climate. And if you look at the total number of days, degree days, that's something us uh, winemakers have to look at and pay attention to, mm -hmm. you'll find that it, it actually is right at the same level as you would see in the Chablis region. So in terms of total warmth that our vines are experiencing during the growing season, they're almost identical. It's just how that warmth happens is very different. Okay. And so that's one of the changes that you see here. The other major difference is the soil itself. And so here, you know, it's funny because we talk about European wines as being from the old world and we talk about California wines as being from the new world. And there's no better way of explaining that, at least I think today, than the fact that this is literally old world and the fact that the soils are 200 million years old. With and the this oysters. Is, with oysters. Okay. And this is new world. Our soils, even in the oldest parts of this county, are less than 10 million years old. How, question. How do you determine the, do you have geologists that come out? Yes, so soil or? surveys have been okay. done and uh, they can actually look in, they find soft fossil records in certain places where they can then start dating as well as carbon dating and things like That's that. Neat. Um, and so yeah, they know that the, the soils 
in the this part of California are very very young soils. They've okay. been pushed up over time by the the San Andreas Fault, and because of that. Um, we're looking at soils that are of marine origin, mm -hmm. but they're not of marine origin of like living things no. like the like the oyster shells. This is actually mostly just uplifted beach, uplifted um, sand from the ocean itself. Oh, cool! As it slowly moves into California, so both marine soils but very different origins. Right, right. So um, this one would have more fossil material in it. Without a doubt, yes. you walk through a vineyard in Chablis, you will find fossilized oysters. Oh, that's cool. um, we don't see those same fossilized oysters, but we have uh, this very well-drained sandy soil that mm -hmm. is. Absolutely exceptional for growing Burgundian varieties as well. Okay. But taste different. Okay. So let's taste. All right, let's do it. Same one, same glass. Why not? So here we have our 2018 Russian River Valley Chardonnay. And right away, you're going to see a difference in the nose. Totally different. Yeah. Same variety. It's the exact same grape. Exact same variety. Yes. So right. both Chardonnays. Yes. Both are Chardonnays, but the origin is leading us in a different direction and our winemaking is following. Okay. What I love- That's a totally of, different wine. Totally different. Yeah, both Chardonnays. But you could have these at different points in the middle. You wouldn't pair these with the same foods. Not at mm -hmm. all. This, I mean, you're looking at your, your, like your fresh shellfish, right? Your right. oysters, um, maybe you're doing like, you know, steamer clams or something like cool. that. Cool, yeah, absolutely. This is gonna stand up to, you know, your roast chicken. Um, your your white fish with a, a little bit of a cream sauce. Mm -hmm. I would actually do that, and I know this always makes people a little crazy, but I think Chardonnays that have some body and some texture to them actually go really, really well with a well-marbled steak. Okay. Um, because you have that great fattiness of the steak and pairing it with that beautiful acidity, just, it's a, it's a magical pairing, um, but it's gotta be a good steak. So here we've utilized barrel fermentation, and that's right. partly to match with the, the flavor profile we're getting out of the out of the grapes. Mm -hmm. um, much more in that apple realm. We're not in citrus land here. We're talking about like Gravenstein apples, um, a, a sweeter fruit, mm -hmm. uh, a more uh, nuanced uh, aromatic in terms of there being spice elements. And part of that's coming from the French oak barrels we use, but a lot of that's coming from the nature of the wine itself. And it's the bottles are slightly different, is that? The, they're is both that stylistic a, or everything? It's a bit stylistic, okay. but traditionally this is what we call a burgundy bottle. So okay. this bottle is traditionally associated with grapes coming out of the burgundy region, both Pinot Noir as well as Chardonnay. Right. Um, you'll also see this bottle used in the Rhone Valley to the south. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of connections between the Rhone and Burgundy in terms of uh, culture and history. And so you see the same bottle type being used to the south. Okay, cool. All yeah. right, and where, so this is bottle would be traditionally for Chablis. Yes, so Chablis, Chablis. part of Burgundy, so same type of bottle. Okay. And in the Russian River Valley, we, we follow that tradition, and when we bottle Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, we put it in that Burgundy bottle as well. Okay, cool. Yeah. Very good. Neat. So that's, that's in a nutshell, the, the difference between the two, but it even gets more deep when you start going into Pinot Noir. Should, okay. we, should we venture over? I think we should. Why not? Why not? It's 3 o'clock on a Wednesday. Why not? Okay, should I move these over here, or...? And if you want to turn around, you can start with the, the Bourgogne. Okay, that's pretty. So this, this first wine um, we're going to have is going to be the Jean-Claude Boisset mm -hmm. Bourgogne Pinot Noir. Um, and it's only in the last decade or so that they've been allowed to even use Pinot Noir on the label. Previous to that, they had to, it would be a Bourgogne Rouge. They would just be a red wine for right. So now, why is that? Why is that? Is it regulated by the French government? Yes. Or by the... the the French are. It's interesting because when it comes to the selling of the wine, the French are actually much easier on their uh, on their wineries. So it's mm -hmm. it's very easy as a winer to sell in France. You can sell directly. You can sell to whoever comes by your door. You can right. sell across the country. Um, but the regulations when it comes to how a wine is described and how a wine is made and how a wine is farmed are much, much stricter than what we have in California. And that's to protect the integrity of the product or of, the region? Or? And of the origin. So okay. they uh, they very much, and I, you see this with French cheeses as well Absolutely. and other French products, um, they very much pride um, themselves in the fact that the origin of the place is a, is a foundational part of the product itself. It's part of its story, it's part of its history, it's part of its quality. Um, and in order to protect that, they've instituted very strict rules in terms of labeling. So anytime you see a wine that says Bourgogne, you know it's coming from the Burgundy region. And it's a fairly small region. Uh, to give you a sense, uh, Burgundy and Sonoma County are roughly equivalent in terms of the total number of acres of, of grapes planted. So okay. it's about 
small, about really the same. Small. It's fairly small. Yeah. It's much more spread out um, because in Burgundy, they uh, there's a lot of regulations when it comes to how vineyards, um, where vineyards can be planted. And so typically they're planted along hillsides mm -hmm. and they wouldn't be planted along the flats. In California, we can plant wherever we want. Now, why is the, why the regulation? Does it have to do with the, the wines or what is it? Um, part of it has to do with quality, okay. but part of it also has to do with the economics. Um, and when it comes down to it, vineyards that are planted on the flats are gonna be much more fertile land. Um, they typically won't produce as high a quality of grape for wine, but they will produce much more of them. And so it would reduce the overall quality. You can still plant grapes down here. Mm -hmm. You just wouldn't be able to label them as a Burgundy. All right. You'd be able to label them as a generic red wine. Mm -hmm. How'd you learn all this? Study. Yeah. Drinking. So Pinot Noir, which is very hard to describe when it comes to flavors. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up on a farm. I often find uh, inspiration from those experiences when I come to describe Pinot on Mars. Uh, and we won't go into detail, but there are fruit elements here as well, and mm -hmm. spice elements, but I think one of the things that becomes so seductive about Pinot Mars from anywhere in the world are the textural feels that you get, the velvety feel, the way it caresses your mouth, um, how it long it lasts on your palate, and how it evolves, how the flavors change over time. Mm -hmm. And that's why Burgones, Pinot Noirs, have become uh, world famous for those qualities. Um, this is coming from several different villages throughout the region of Burgundy, mostly in the southern section. So from oh, yeah. what we call the Cote de Bone to the south is where these grapes are coming out okay. of. Okay, and to give an example, how does it match up as compared to the Pinot de Bores that are, that are here? Well, let's like try one of those again, we, finish let's, this first. You can use that other glass. That's good too, all right. So the Pinot Noirs here, again, it's the same idea that we saw with the Chablis. We're working with younger soils. Now, the soils in Burgundy are not, in, in this part of Burgundy, are not the same as what we saw in the Chablis region of Burgundy. The soils are going to be a little bit younger, but still over 100 million years of age, um, coming from the Jurassic time period, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of cool. You know, when we think about Jurassic Park, we don't always realize that that's being named after a small region in France. Um, so every time someone is talking about dinosaurs in Jurassic Park, uh, yeah, they're, they're talking about the Jura region as well. Um, but anyways, uh, the soils are a mix, so they're not as uniform. What's important when we talk about Burgundian soils is a mix of clays mm -hmm. as well as limestone. And limestone is what gives it a lot of that kind of uh, ethereal mineral quality to these wines. Mm -hmm. and, are associated with the top flight vineyards in Burgundy, um, having that element of limestone. Okay, when you say mineral, what, yep. do you mean, what do you mean by that? That is a great question. That's, so that's a lot of really good yeah, questions. Yeah, um, mineral is one of those flavors that we often refer to when we're talking about something that isn't necessarily a fruit or a spice, mm -hmm. but is it a chemical flavor? It's this. It, it's literally the flavor of rocks. It, as a child, you put rocks in your mouth. Mm -hmm. um, or it's been a while since it's I've been a while. Well, I don't know about you. You, know, but yeah. you got little girls. I'm sure they can describe them for you. Um, <laughs> How do rocks taste, sweetie? I don't know. <laughs> good, uh, good but it's often something in the line of salty and yeah. more in that realm, but mm -hmm. also literally like what a rock tastes like. Um, mm -hmm. And there's different elements of mineral. Some of them are a dusty mineral element. Some of them are like wet rocks, like you would find like on the border of a stream. Okay. Um, so there's all these different mineral aspects. Um, and you'll find that the mineral that you see in Chablis is different than the mineral you would see in that red burgundy. Okay. We now don't kind of... get a lot of minerality in California. There's a few exceptions. All right, so do we have minerality here? I, I don't think so. I, I think we have so fruit either, here. But I really don't know. We have fruit. fruit. Okay. Beautiful fruit. Now you make this one? Yes? I do. I do. This is our Deloche Russian River Valley Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. This is the 2017 vintage. And then it's totally different than the Totally Pinot. different, yeah. That's, that's Both amazing. Pinot Noir, I think the connection you find is, again, going back to the feel in your mouth, the velvety feel, the softness, mm -hmm. the way it kind of encompasses the whole mouth without having a lot of weight or a lot of kind of rugged texture to it. It's yeah. just, it's there. So it's funny. It's more like they're like cousins than twins. And yes. You can tell the similarities. but Without a doubt. They're, they yeah. are the same variety, but totally different worlds that they grew up in. Okay. And so, yeah, once again, the soils are much younger. The climate is much more moderate. Um, the winemaking is very similar. In fact, mm -hmm. I, I know the winemaker behind this, uh, the Jean-Claude Boisse wine quite well. Mm -hmm. um, Gregory Patron and I have been collaborating and knowing each other for uh, 
15 plus years now. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a, it's a completely different um, world we're working in. And so our, our wines taste different, even though we're using many of the same techniques and aging in the same type of barrels. Right. Um, so it goes it's a to different world. Different, different climates, different soil types. Yes. And that and that leads you off in a different direction. Yes. Right. So even though we're working with the same base material, um, and that's why Pinot Noir is so fun. It shows this more than any other variety. Uh, Pinot Noir is is the most, is one of the most, if not the most, um, ancient of varieties. It's documented at least back to Charlemagne. Um, really? Yes. The so, King of the Franks, really? Yes. Oh my gosh. In fact, there's a whole story about Charlemagne planting white grapes Tell because it. his let's, wife. Let's hear it. Well, so allegedly Charlemagne was celebrating and uh, he was enjoying some wine with all of his, you know, knights, mm -hmm. um, and uh, they were drinking great red Pinot Noir, and uh, it was starting, you know, late into the night. His, he was getting a little sloppy. It was starting to stain his beard, and his his wife got left. concerned and said, "Honey." On your on your parcel of Corton Charlemagne, which, which is where is it on the map? This hillside right here. This is named after Charlemagne. Okay. Um, you need to plant white grapes because that way, you know, if it sloshes around a little bit on your face, no one will notice. And so that is why the the hill of Corton, the Charlemagne is planted to Chardonnay, where the Le Corton is planted to Pinot Noir. That's really neat. Okay. Um, although there is still a parcel of Corton uh, Clos de Wa, so the the enclosure of the king. Um, that is still Pinot Noir. Lenny, you are a wealth of, in, of information, truly. I mean that. Have been for many years. What? Yeah, in some ways. Well. Do you think you're smarter than me? <laughs> this is a delicious wine you all should enjoy. Uh -huh. So thanks so much. Regina, what? Any more questions about Burgundy in uh, California? Okay, Burgundy. Okay, so Pinot Noir. What do you serve this with? Well, and what would you serve a Bourgogne with versus? You know, this is. I think when it comes to Pinot Noir, there's a lot of flexibility in how you can serve it. Um, a lot of people will do different types of cheeses, which I think you can see the natural pairings that you can go from there. Yeah. Um, right. Also, you know, when you look at things like trout or salmon, I think they pair very, very well with those kind of pink skin or pink fleshed fish. Mm -hmm. um, you could look at things like mussels. I think they would pair really well with there. Right. You can do a lot of interesting things with different cuisines with Pinot Noir because of the kaleidoscope of flavors it has. The most important thing to me is you have to be very careful about acid level mm -hmm. in terms of what the sauce is made out of mm -hmm. and also spice level because it will overwhelm the, the wine quite easily that way. That said, there's lots of Indian-inspired, Southeast Asian-inspired, Chinese-inspired cuisines that if you play around with it, there's a lot of fun stuff that comes out with Pinot Noir mm -hmm. and those cuisines because of just the, the different flavor profiles, soy, um, all the different spices that come out of Pinot Noir, um, elements of plum, elements of dark berry, all of a sudden they infuse back and forth. Um, with those different types of cuisines. So there's a lot you can do there, but then you can fall back on the classics. And to me, the ultimate classic with at least Russian River Pinot Noir, lamb chops. Heck yeah. Mm -hmm. Nothing like a good set of lamb chops and a, a mm -hmm. beautiful glass of Pinot. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful meal. Okay, so it's, you know, it's pretty easy to buy your wines, but if one wanted to buy for, a, buy one of yeah. the different varieties, what would, what well, would one do? So, um, I, I, need to shamelessly plug uh, one of our partners out there in the world right now Let's and that's it. Oakville Grocery. Um, oh, I love Oakville Grocery. Both in Healdsburg as well as in Oakville. Um, Wait, is, this, what's there? is it Oakville Grocery in Oakville? Yeah. Where? Right off the square. Oh, that's right. It's okay. on the southeast corner of the square. Mm -hmm. um, and they have a great website that just opened up, Oakville Wine Merchant, um, which mm -hmm. is kind of a related business to Oakville. And uh, you can buy either physically at Oakville Grocery or you can um, buy it off the website. And uh, yeah, very, very reasonably priced wines. Um, and uh, they have a tremendous selection, but that's, yeah, that's beautiful stuff. And that would be my um, suggestion um, to have access to that. Uh, the other route, um, we have uh, at Boise, we, we do a lot of innovative things, especially with what's going on with the ongoing COVID thing. Um, and we have what we call wine ambassadors out there um, who, would love to, uh, to meet you and help you introduce you to all the great wines that we um, have to offer from not only California, but also from France and beyond as well. So um, that's another great way if you're you're not able to get so locally local, the, local um, to, so to reach out to one of them. So the ambassadors have the full portfolio, not just the domestic wines, but also the they have access, French wines yeah. as well. Yes. Oh my goodness gracious. Yeah. Okay, Brian, is there anything else that we should know in advance about French wines? Um, don't yeah. be intimidated. 
please explore. It's a beautiful area with lots of fun wines. And while we only scratched the surface of Burgundy, I hope we made it at least simple enough to know Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, delicious stuff. Mm -hmm. Come enjoy. And Charlemagne. Bye. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.